Play mode. Hello, everyone. I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and welcome to today's webinar, which is being hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with Enerdata. And today's webinar is focused on energy efficiency measures to boost building renovation. And one important note of mention before we begin the webinar is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And before we begin, just want to go over some of the webinar features. Uh, you do have two options for audio. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will just eliminate the possibility of any feedback and echo. And if you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin that you should use to dial in. And if anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at the number displayed at the bottom of the slide. That number is 888. 2593826. And we encourage people from the audience to ask questions at any point during the webinar. Uh, to ask a question, simply type it into the question pane and submit it there. And I will receive those questions and present them to the panelists during our question and answer session following the presentations. And if anyone's having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, we will be posting PDF copies of the presentations to cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training so that you may follow along as the speakers present. And also we'll be posting an audio recording of the presentations to that uh, page within about a week of today's broadcast. And just to note, we are also adding recordings to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you will find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. <clears throat> And today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Mr. Bruno Lapoloni and Karine Sabi. And these panelists have been kind enough to join us to explore existing potential savings in building stock and present some innovative financial schemes. And before our speakers begin their presentations, I just want to provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentations, we will have the question and answer session and then a brief survey. And this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center was formed. The Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Some outcomes of this unique initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as the webinar you are now attending. And there's four primary goals for the Solution Center. The first goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Second is to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. Third is to deliver dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the center also strives to foster dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. And our primary audience is energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. And this slide shows one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides, which is its no-cost expert policy assistance, known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are each available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So, for example, in the area of energy efficiency policy, we're very pleased to have Jeff Deason, the senior analyst with the Climate Policy Initiative, serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in energy efficiency policy or any other clean energy sector, we do encourage you to use this valuable service. And again, it's provided to you free of charge. 
So to find out if the Ask an Expert service can benefit your work, please contact me directly at sean.esterly at nrl.gov or at 303-384-7436. Uh, we also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. And so now I would like to provide brief introductions for today's panelists. Our first speaker today is Bruno Lapoloni, and Bruno is a vice president and co-founder of Enerdata. And then following Bruno, we will hear from Karine Sebi. Karine is a project manager in energy efficiency at Enerdata. And so now with those brief introductions, I would like to welcome Bruno to the webinar. Thank you very much for the introduction. So before we start the presentation, I will say a few words about uh, Enerdata. Uh, Enerdata is an independent company that was created in uh, 1991. Uh, maybe you can change the slide, please. Thank you. Uh, which is specialized in uh, global energy market analysis and modeling and also specialized on energy efficiency and demand analysis. Uh, our work uh, rely on a lot of uh, detailed database on uh, all kinds of aspects on energy environment uh, and so on and uh, several forecasting models. We are based in uh, Grenoble and we have offices in Paris and uh, Singapore to cover the Asia. Our expertise on uh, energy efficiency deals with energy efficiency indicators and uh, databases. We have been involved in a uh, lot of projects worldwide, Odyssey in Europe. We are working a lot in Latin America with uh, UN CEPAL. Uh, we are working also with uh, ADEM on uh, several regional projects. And we look also, and this is maybe the, what we'll present today, uh, our, we are working on the evaluation of energy efficiency policies and measures with a specific focus on buildings. You have a list of uh, different uh, projects in which we are involved, and uh, this uh, presentation today will mainly rely on the entrance project. All references are given at the end of the presentation. So our presentation will be made of uh, three parts, but uh, Two main parts, one I will cover, which gives the EU background, uh, and the second one uh, that will be presented by my colleague Karin will deal with some interesting experience of uh, financing energy efficiency in building. About the EU background, first of all, the building uh, sector that covers the residential and the service sector uh, represent 40% of the final energy consumption, so it's a significant share of, uh, of the energy consumption in the EU. And for electricity, it is even 55% of the total consumption. Buildings, the residential buildings represent two-thirds of uh, the total, so we will mainly often focus about uh, dwellings because it's an uh, important uh, target. The trend now is that the energy consumption has been decreasing since 2008 uh, and the decrease is not fully linked to the economic crisis we were suffering in, in Europe. It is also mainly driven by the impact of energy efficiency. So in that case, energy savings is uh, stronger than the effect of economic growth. And we expect that this trend, even if the economic growth is coming back, will go on, at the to say the consumption will decrease in absolute values because of the effect of uh, existing policies that have been implemented. We have implemented policies in, in buildings to cover the heating, mainly the thermal uses, but also on appliances. So this presentation will mainly uh, focus on uh, thermal using, space heating which is uh, about 70% of the consumption uh, of dwellings. I said the consumption is decrease, will decrease even in, uh, in a baseline uh, scenario, but we expect that in an ambitious policy scenario, the decrease uh, could, uh, the, the potential of a reduction of the consumption could be as much as 26%. So the forest is a kind of potential that we could try to tap with appropriate policy measure, 
it is cost effective for the consumers, but, and this is shown on the right slide, uh, the red line show what we could expect with the baseline, but the baseline include a lot of policy measures, all the policy measures that have been already implemented, and the ambitious one is the potential that could come from additional measure. And in that case, we could expect the consumption to decrease by 1.8 percent per year. And the decrease in CO2 emission would be much higher because of a shift to uh, less CO2 emission uh, fuels. Most of the potential will have to come from existing buildings because new construction in Europe uh, represents roughly in a, in a good period 1 percent of the existing stock, but since the crisis it, it is even less down to 0.7 percent as you can see from the graph on the left. And uh, what we have to take into account also is that in this existing stock, half of the dwellings were built before 1970, that is to say before there were exist uh, the first thermal regulation. So the target is clearly on the refurbishment of existing building stock, which is not easy. What is the EU legislation in that area? Um, countries separately in Europe have been implementing uh, building codes, uh, mainly targeted the space heating use, that were regularly tightened for some of them uh, across time, but there have been no common rule and approach. And in 2002, the European Commission, that is a kind of governing board of, the, of all European countries, uh, adopted a, a law, and actually it, it went through the European Parliament, uh, which adopted a law known as the Energy Performance Building Directive, in short we say EPBD, and it was the first attempt to harmonize building code in, in the EU. It required all EU countries to uh, set up building code based on the old building approach, so-called performance-based approach. Uh, not looking at element by element, but fixing target as to the consumption of the building. It also requires, this is very important, because by experience we have seen many countries having one uh, standard, uh, but not improving it or uh, making it tighten. So it required a regular update of this standard every five years. And also what was innovative was to look at renovation, and it was the first really attempt, because there were no real countries with uh, such measure, to make, uh, to create uh, standards in the case of renovation of large existing building, in that case it was above uh, 1,000 square meter, where they had to follow standards based on the, on the new building. And uh, the additional interesting aspect of this legislation was the introduction of mandatory energy certification of buildings, like uh, what exists for appliance and it is uh, well known is to be able to characterize what is the efficiency of, of the buildings. We, in, in most countries it's through letter A, B, C or it can be a, as to the absolute value of consumption of the building per square meter. And this is mandatory for all buildings that are sold or rented. Uh, then, uh, the importance of the building sector, the importance of uh, looking at uh, renovation uh, led to uh, what they call the recast of the, build, the directive, uh, so it's kind of update, and it's often referred as a second directive or EPBD2, which uh, was uh, a bit more precise on different aspects. One aspect was to say that the standards that had to be uh, set up by the country should be in accordance to what is cost optimal, and I will come back to that. So not just having standards, but trying to have standards that correspond to what is cost optimal for the consumers. It also required for new buildings that by around 2020, uh, all new buildings should be nearly zero energy buildings. It's a bit vague definition, but the idea is to have uh, buildings that uh, do not consume much and not only for space heating, but for a certain number of venues. Uh, for instance, if I take the case of uh, France, our country, uh, this, the standards uh, apply to five end use. So it is for space heating, for air cooling, for water heating, for ventilation, and for lighting. So th this is very severe to imagine buildings that have to cover this use with almost uh, no uh, energy consumption. 
And for existing buildings, that is the target of this uh, presentation, uh, the, there were also some changes that eliminated the threshold for large buildings and said that minimum energy performance requirements were necessary in case of the renovation, major renovation of existing buildings, and the major renovation is characterized by 25% of uh, the building surface being uh, renovated. And also required uh, regulation on building elements for uh, renovation. That is to say, if households want to renovate a dwelling, uh, they have to use elements that meet certain standards. And there was a third law which uh, was adopted in 2012 that was broader than just building, so I just pick what is uh, related to, to building. And it uh, said, and it is known as E, the Energy Efficiency Directive. It said that to enhance uh, the, the target to reach uh, near zero energy building uh, renovation or uh, just near zero in, in new buildings, it requires EU countries to elaborate long-term plans to support uh, renovation and the, the development of uh, such buildings. So it, it is a clearly a signal to uh, go towards uh, low energy existing buildings and not only at new buildings. And this directive also uh, set up a requirements for uh, the public sector to, to play a leading uh, role uh, which was to increase, and in some cases it was to start, a uh, renovation rate for buildings that are owned and occupied by the central government uh, to, at 3% per year, which is quite uh, significant. Now going back to this uh, cost optimality uh, concept that uh, was uh, included in the uh, second EPBD uh, directive, uh, the objective was to be sure that the minimum energy performance requirements that are part of the regulation in each country are set in a view to achieve what is cost optimal, what is cost effective for the consumer and not just settle without, set up the level without looking at the cost. Cost optimal level means, of course, higher in initial investment costs, but these high costs are repaid later on by a lower energy saving. The cost optimality look at the global cost, that is to, take, to say that it will take into account the capital cost, but also the uh, energy expenditure and all other expenditures. Uh, over uh, certain periods, uh, it was agreed to, to take 30 years uh, for the calculation and uh, in all the costs are discounted over a 30 year period. The European Commission established a reference methodological framework that is public and that can be of use for any country in the year, in the year to calculate uh, this cost optimal level for uh, the minimum energy performance requirements for new building, existing building, or for building elements. Um, we'll uh, see on the next slide. Uh, we go into more detail to explain this uh, cost optimality and I will take the example of uh, this entrance project where we have made uh, great use of this uh, methodology to define for each country uh, that were looked at in, in the project, that were nine countries with a deep uh, investigation, of what are the package of solutions that are cost optimal. And the solutions for innovation can be solutions that looked at uh, uh, improving the uh, quality of the building shell, but also using other better, more efficient uh, heating appliance or cooling appliance. So the calculation was done for 12 climatic zones because, of course, uh, the climate is important both in terms of use but also in terms of uh, sun, uh, solar energy that uh, would be available for a solar water heater or solar PV. And the objective of the entrance project was uh, not just to look at the cost optimality but was to find what has, what has the best package of policy measure to be implemented in the country to uh, accelerate, uh, the, accelerate the, the renovation of the existing building and if possible to go uh, as much as possible toward deep renovation. 
Deep renovation means that uh, you don't only get 5% saving, but a more significant saving when you implement uh, energy efficiency solutions. So what was done is that for each building type, and we considered uh, four building types, um, that is I think on, on the next slide, but uh, it's a single family houses, uh, multi-family dwelling, office and uh, school. And we took as uh, the reference for this uh, building type, badly insulated dwelling, which should be the target for the first uh, approach for renovation. So building built in the 50s or, uh, or 60s when there were no uh, regulations. And we, s we set up in the project cost uh, energy cloud that represents the global cost versus uh, net primary energy demand for a large variety of renovation options. Um, we considered for the building envelope 34 options for heating, cooling equipment, 34 also uh, possibilities, alternative. And if you combine all the options, uh, it can go up to 30,000 combinations. It meant uh, a lot of calculation that were carried out by our colleague in, in Milan, a technical uh, university. And uh, this is shown in, uh, in this cost cloud, and you have an example on, on, the, on the next slide, where each point corresponds to uh, a solution. You have in uh, red with the arrow what is the present situation for the, the building. And then you can see uh, down uh, the zone that is called A, which represents the solution where the cost is the lowest. And the cost is not the investment cost, but it is the total discounted cost about uh, 30 years. And B on the left correspond to solution that correspond to the lowest uh, consumption. So if we look at uh, low energy building, uh, what called NZEB, B would represent the NZEB zone. And what we are interested in here uh, is a uh, zone corresponding to uh, the, mi the glo minimum global cost. And in the directive, it is even specified that uh, countries have the margin to do, fix the regulation in the range of 15% around this uh, uh, minimum cost, but as it was, it was possible to see from the, the graph, actually, and this is the example of Paris area, this was done for a uh, 15 climatic zone, very often the, the zone of the cost, lowest cost was not just a few points, but it was really a zone quite broad, but in case it is uh, one single point. Uh, regulation said we can choose between plus or minus 15 er, er, percent to take into account the uncertainty. After that, there are two very technical slides just to show you how we have worked, but I don't present, uh, I will not present all the detail. Uh, the idea was to show what, what was the best solution and the distribution among all the possibilities, all the points that were uh, displayed. And the, the graph show, the first graph show for the building envelope, what was the distribution of the most interesting solution and the circle one were the two best solutions, but there are others uh, that uh, were also interesting. And each code, uh, it would be too long to explain, correspond to E for the envelope, uh, W for window, for different options that are characterized uh, under the graph. and. Hardly, hardly readable like this, but the purpose is just to show you what we have been doing. You can find a lot of information that is freely available on the entrance uh, website. And the se second slide uh, relate to uh, the distribution of heating optimal solution and different aspects uh, linked to heating. And in the case of uh, Paris area, district heating turned out uh, in 80% of the case to be the best solution uh, followed by ground uh, heat pump, uh, GSHP, or air heat pump. Uh, but for other areas like Milan, uh, Madrid, or uh, other, the, the distribution of course is very difficult because it all depends on the availability of resources and the, the heat and cooling load. 
Now, in summary, you can see that uh, there is a lot of effort to boost uh, renovation, to push towards uh, costly renovation uh, package, deep renovation, and this means high investment costs. Of course, that will pay back over the lifetime of the, uh, the building, but the difficulty is that the investor, especially when they are household, have difficulty to think uh, about cost effectiveness uh, over a 30 year period. So, the question now is how to, to get the household or other invest, investor invest in uh, deep renovation and for that we have to look for innovative financing and several countries have tried to develop uh, innovative financing package or other measures and Karin will go on uh, showing some examples and lessons we can draw from these measures. Karin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bruno. So um, now I think that we have a, um, a clear understanding of the European legislation and uh, recommendations that are sent to uh, European member states to boost renovation uh, in existing stock. So in this second part, uh, I will first uh, briefly present you two innovative schemes, uh, the UK uh, Green Deal and uh, in Germany the KFW uh, program, refurbishment program. But of course there are also uh, many uh, other uh, incentive uh, and financial schemes uh, implemented in Europe, like uh, in France, for instance, the soft loan uh, entitled the EcoPTZ. But uh, we wanted to uh, focus on the, the most uh, criticized and popular uh, scheme implemented in Europe. And then uh, in the second part, we will uh, look uh, at uh, the scenario uh, results from the entrance project that Bruno already uh, presented um, uh, in the first part. part. Sorry. So Bruno, you just said that um, energy efficiency measures should uh, incentivize households to implement renovation solutions and that, that they should um, help uh, uh, household to overcome the problem of uh, high init initial renovation costs. And um, the purpose of the Green Deal implemented in 2030 is exactly to help households to get access to um, energy efficiency improvements with little or no upfront costs. So how does it work? On that slide, I briefly uh, present you the Green Deal process in eight points. So first of all, and also interesting in the Green Deal, pay uh, a Green Deal advisor for the initial assessment. Second, the advisor provides the household with recommendation on which measure could be installed and that are compliant with the golden rule. It means that the Green Deal assessor recommends appropriate improvements for the house and should indicate whether they are expected to pay for themselves through their reduced energy bill. Third, based on this uh, recommendation or assessment, households are supposed to uh, shop around and find the Green Deal provider with uh, the best offer. Fourth, once the contract is signed with the Green Deal provider, the Green Deal provider will then order the Green Deal installer to carry out the agreed measure. How does it work concretely, this financial scheme? Well, part of the cost of the measures uh, is financed through a loan from the Green Deal provider and the Green Deal uh, support schemes. The loan that is going up to 20 for 25 years and uh, the rate is ranging from 6 to 8 percent is uh, repaid by a way of uh, surcharge on the electricity bill collected by the electricity supplier and it's paid back to the Green Deal provider. I remind that the value of the monetary saving triggered by the measure installed should be greater than this surcharge. This is the Green Deal Golden Rule. Last but not the least, the Green Deal is based on the innovative idea of attaching loan not to the owner but to the property itself, um, technically through the electricity meter in the property. 
So households can co-finance measure either by providing some of the required investments themselves or they can use the UK uh, policy instruments that are proposed. So the first one is the energy company obligation. This partial financing means that uh, where customers uh, choose measures that are unlikely uh, to pay for themselves in their lifetime, they can still get money towards the installation cost up to the value of the estimating savings. The energy company obligation, uh, the preceding scheme was uh, known as the carbon emission redu reduction target. So the uh, energy company obligation places legal obligation on the larger supplier, energy supplier, to deliver energy efficiency measures to domestic customers' buildings with a focus on fuel poverty on uh, low-income uh, customers. Besides, um, and to promote the Green Deal plan, UK government launched uh, two successive uh, incentive schemes. The first one was implemented from January 2013 up to June uh, 2014, uh, is the Green Deal cashback scheme. So uh, it's um, a subsidy that uh, depends on the type of measure and uh, households can get a, a cashback for the um, implemented measure and for instance uh, it was like 6,000 US dollars for implementing a solid wall insulation or $400 uh, dollar for uh, installing a new efficient boiler. Then the second scheme uh, implemented in June uh, 2014 uh, uh, was the, the Green Deal Home Improvement Fund uh, and here it proposed uh, a subsidy up to 9,000 US dollars for implementing a solid wall insulation so the amount uh, has increased and uh, it uh, proposed a new um, cashback uh, for implementing at least two solutions. Unfortunately this last uh, scheme uh, collapsed immediately because there were uh, too many um, applications. So the, um, the Green Deal has been uh, criticized by a broad range of groups, but let's see on that slide uh, what are the impact um, assessments, uh, what uh, type of measures were implemented. Uh, so on the, on the graph, on the left part, one can see that uh, the, the Green Deal finance attracted a very limited number of households. I put in brackets the number uh, since to the implementation, so since the January 2013, only uh, 3,200 households uh, um, signed the Green Deal finance, that is to say the loan repaid by the electricity bill. In addition, we can see that uh, the Green Deal finance did not favor deep, deep retrofitting, such as uh, solid wall insulation, for instance. Uh, we can see on that slide for the Green Deal finance, uh, a lot of uh, households uh, decided to implant uh, micro-generation or a replacement of, um, of a boiler. And the number of solutions implemented per household is quite low, like 2.2 uh, measures uh, implemented per, per household. As a result, the Green Deal Finance has a very lim little impact on the thermal insulation market today and uh, is well below initial government uh, projections. The ECHO, as I explained previously, is supposed to fund measures that do not meet the golden rule. And we can see that 35% uh, of measures come from cavity wall, but compared to the previous scheme, the carbon emission reduction target, uh, insulation activity has decreased over time. Then the subsidy scheme, the Green Deal House Improvement uh, uh, Fund, targeted mainly solid wall insulation. Indeed, we've seen that the, the cashback was uh, higher than the, the cashback scheme. And as I told you previously, it collapsed immediately and uh, still the number of applications uh, is quite low uh, as uh, 8,800 households uh, uh, asked for um, that uh, grant. So, Briefly and uh, as a conclusion, 
the Green Deal was made to smooth uh, upfront costs uh, thanks to uh, this loan. However, we've seen uh, that uh, it attracted few uh, households and they implemented mainly uh, PV installation and boiler replacements. Uh, so, as a conclusion, we can detect that the golden rule limits the impact on the thermal insulation market. Uh, and uh, we've seen as well that the Green Deal is very sensitive to uh, subsidies like the cashback and uh, GDHIF program that collapsed immediately. So, um, there is a need to fix long-term drivers and oriented incentive measures towards deep retrofit to avoid this continual cycle of boom and bust. Um, we feel as well that uh, the, the scheme does not give enough incentive to implement a package of solutions as uh, Bruno presented uh, previously. If we want to, to catch the, the, the cost optimality, this is very important to, uh, to implement this uh, package of uh, uh, renovation solution. Um, and uh, as a, an answer, the, the UK government decided uh, to, uh, to, to offer a second release of the Green Deal Home Improvement Fund in December 2014. And now they, they uh, said that uh, uh, households had to implement at least two measures to benefit from uh, the grant. So uh, the last uh, point is a transition to uh, the second scheme I want to present to you. Uh, is that the Green Deal, uh, uh, the thermal performance insulation measures should be promoted and should be an eligible condition to benefit from, uh, from uh, the loan or the grant. So now let's turn to the German case. Uh, What's going on in Germany? The KFW is well known in Europe and is one of the leading programs among building refurbishment and measures. KFW is a German state-owned promotional bank and is mandated by law to carry out its promotional activities. KFW uh, acts in close cooperation with the Federal Ministry of Building, Transport and Urban Development. Incentives uh, are offered by the Public Investment Bank with a strong financial backing from government. The government injects from funds through the KFW and dedicated credit lines are opened with commercial banks to offer grants or loans to uh, customers. Uh, the objective of the program entitled Energy Efficient Construction and Refurbishment is to provide financing by way of loan or grants for energy efficient construction and renovation in the residential sector. And the rule is simple, the higher the energy efficiency, the higher the incentives. And this is clearly what is uh, presented uh, on that slide. So, in order to benefit from the uh, advantages of promotional financing condition, it's a precondition that the efficiency standard achieved are better than the requirements as set out in the German Energy Saving Ordinance uh, for new buildings. The program reduced the complex legwork requirements to uh, two values. So, the first one is the annual primary energy demand compared to the demand of a, a new building, the so-called reference building. And the second is the structural heat insulation uh, still compared to the reference building. That is to say the specific transmission heat loss. The basis of, for measuring the level of energy efficiency is a so-called KFW efficiency house standard. For energy efficiency refurbishment activity, you can see on the slide that there is in total six promotional levels, starting with the most efficient one, the efficiency house 55 as the most ambitious level. So, um, on that slide, you can see that the KFW refurbishment program includes either a, a loan or a grant. So, let's uh, concentrate on the loan. The loan at annual rate of 1% can cover up to uh, an, invest, an investment of $90,000 per household for energy efficient refurbishment, plus it proposes a repayment bonus or uh, subsidy that is calculated 
on the loan moment and um, the repayment bonus depends on the level of energy efficiency of refurbishment. Besides, for the customers who do not target deep retrofits, uh, KFW offers a promotional loans for single measures. So single measures can be, for instance, a window or changing heating systems or improving insulation. Second, uh, if customers don't want to apply for a loan, there is a second option um, to uh, apply for a, a grant uh, uh, for investment. And again, the amount available is based on the same energy efficiency level and is calculated as for the loan on the maximum loan uh, amount applicable. It varies between 10% and 25% of the maximum uh, loan amount. On that slide, uh, uh, as a review, uh, we look at the KFW impact assessment. So KFW approved uh, around 12 billion of commitments in 2012. Uh, these figures include the, the construction part of the program. And among, uh, among which, like 1.8 billion uh, came from the federal government which in turn mobilized a total of around 32 billion investments. So it means that there is a good leverage effect, uh, the, the, the ratio between the, the, the private and the public investment is very good. Since 2006, like uh, 1.8 million, this is the cumulative uh, numbers, uh, so 1.8 million housing units were, were refurbished uh, thanks to that program. Uh, and it's around roughly 250,000 uh, households per year, which represents already 5% of the, of the total stock. And uh, the average saving per house uh, is 26% uh, uh, of red energy reduction consumption prior to uh, refurbishment. Uh, what uh, is the type of uh, measures implemented? Is it a single measure? Is it loan or a grant and so on? So the statistics given by the KFW program told us that 82% of households applied for single measures. However, households can apply to several single measures. That is to say they can uh, apply for a grant uh, concerning a window plus insulation plus heating and on average uh, it is said that between five, uh, four to five measures are implemented uh, per household. So there is a good uh, uh, chance that household implement a package of measures in the frame of, uh, of uh, that program. As a result, there is a large majority, like 70% uh, of households that received a grant that rather than a loan. Uh, deep thermal solutions are largely implemented in case of uh, package of measures, that is to say if they reach the energy efficiency house target, but still uh, the results show us that insulation solutions are implemented as well and in the majority of the case of single measures. So briefly again as a conclusion, uh, we can say that the KFW Bank uh, gives uh, simpler access to capital and makes loans attractive to borrowers. Uh, the financial scheme is uh, based uh, under uh, energy efficiency conditions. Besides, if the customer don't target uh, the deep retrofit, there is still an opportunity to apply for a, a soft loan for single measures. Uh, but we've, we've seen that uh, grants are strictly preferred than loans. Uh, but we've seen as well that uh, there is a good uh, energy savings sense to uh, that program. However, we can uh, ask, uh, we can wonder if uh, uh, this program uh, is, um, is sustained because, uh, sustainable, sorry, because it depends highly on public budget to which extent and until when, but it seems that uh, the government sends good uh, um, 
signals because early January, like uh, one week ago, uh, they announced that there is a 5% increase in the repayment bonuses for all KFW efficiency health standards. I think uh, it's, it's uh, for make the, to make the promotion of uh, the soft loan program uh, rather than uh, grant. Uh, so uh, on that slide, uh, I hope that I will have uh, more time uh, during the question or at the end of the presentation to present you uh, in detail this benchmark analysis, which is not the purpose of the presentation. It's just to uh, to uh, to, uh, to make uh, a summary of each, uh, of each uh, scheme. So in green you have the, the main uh, uh, advantage or a strong strength and in red the main weaknesses. Uh, and uh, as a conclusion I would like to say that uh, um, to make a transition with what Bruno presented uh, about the cost optimality, the KFW is better than the Green Deal scheme because uh, uh, it, uh, it yields to higher savings at uh, lower costs. The package of measures uh, uh, on average are higher than uh, in the Green Deal uh, program. So now in, the, in this uh, last uh, part of the presentation, um, we will take advantage of uh, the results uh, presented in the frame of the, the entrance uh, project. So Bruno already introduced you uh, the, the, the project. Uh, just uh, uh, to, to say quickly that a different set of national policy packages on refurbishment, on refurbishments have been developed in close cooperation plus cooperation with national stakeholders and policymakers in each country. The scenario has been uh, simulated with the invert uh, EE Lab model uh, that takes into account the cost of the various renovation option and decision criteria of different groups of investors. The scenario are country uh, specific and cannot be uh, compared. However, energy savings highlight uh, the most powerful and ambitious uh, policy uh, packages. So on this graph, uh, the blue histograms show the energy saving uh, potentials, that is to say the different levels of energy consumption in 2030 obtained under the business as usual scenario and the most ambitious policy set scenario. And the red dot present annual savings obtained over the period 2008 up to 2013, 30, sorry, in the ambitious scenario. Well, the potential of energy savings showed the impact of the most ambitious uh, policy uh, set compared to business as usual in 2030, while the other showed the annual energy consumption reduction since 2008. So on that slide, we, we see that Spain and France have the biggest energy saving potential, ranging from uh, between 16 and 80 percent, and Germany has the highest energy reduction over time. So we will, I will present you briefly in the next slide this, uh, the three packages, policy packages that have been tested and uh, simulated uh, in entrance. Uh, so first, for Spain, uh, the policy packages include the current regularity, uh, regulatory requirements, the current building code, and plus an increase of the uh, financial uh, instruments. And to promote uh, renovation activity, they, um, they expect that uh, there is a vast reduction from 22% uh, to 10% uh, to boost the renovation activity. And uh, they uh, took into account the energy efficiency uh, obligation, like, uh, um, like uh, said in the energy uh, efficiency directive. And one innovative uh, measure is that um, there is an energy efficiency refurbishment obligation in uh, Spain uh, today. The buildings older than the 50 years must have a building assessment report and following two assessment reports, obligation refurbishment to the least performance building are enforced. In France, it follows uh, roughly the same idea. 
So we, uh, we keep the current building code and the current financial and fiscal measures. There is an increase of uh, awareness uh, and coaching program, plus a mandatory renovation enforced at the occasion of real estate trans transaction for the list uh, platform and building. So uh, still, uh, thanks to uh, the assistance uh, provided by uh, the energy performance certificate that Bruno presented uh, in the first part. And of course, it has to be economically uh, feasible. Third, in Germany, uh, again, there is a current policy uh, design with, uh, of course, the continuation of the financial uh, support such as the KFW I presented you uh, previously. Uh, and uh, there is a tightening, a tightening of current energy efficiency uh, requirements for new and existing buildings, plus an introduction of renewable use obligation for all existing buildings in case of heating system change. Finally, uh, as in France, there is uh, an increase in compliance rate of energy efficiency requirements and increase in information uh, awareness of subsidy uh, programs, for instance. As a conclusion, so Bruno um, showed us that there is a very high potential uh, energy saving in the building sector and more particularly in the, in the, in the existing stock sorry, that uh, is the key target. As a, as a, um, and a response, the, the EU uh, legislation, legislation is tightening uh, since a decade uh, and uh, implementing uh, norms on new and existing building. Uh, and um, the objective is to tend to nearly zero energy building in 2020 with a cost optimality condition or as a priority for refurbishment. Then in the second part, I presented you two uh, initiatives launched uh, recently. The first one in UK with a Green Deal that offers an innovative mechanism, but unfortunately, unfortunately we think that it has a poor impact on deep, uh, retrofit activity. And in Germany since 2009, the KFW refurbishment program um, that uh, supports retrofitting according to uh, expecting uh, saving and uh, benefit from a uh, government fund. We think that both schemes show a preference to grants compared to, uh, to loans. And finally, the teaching from the entrance proje projections highlight that uh, efficient package of measures include obligation of renovation, financial scheme like the KFW program, and an increase of uh, information awareness. On that uh, last slide, uh, we, uh, we have put a reference that helped us to, to make uh, that uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Corinne, and thank you, Bruno, for the presentations. Um, and now we will uh, move on to questions from the audience. And before we do, I do just want to remind the audience, if you have any questions for the panelists, you can submit those through the question pane in the GoToWebinar tool. Um, and so the first question, uh, this goes back to Bruno's presentation. And uh, Bruno, you presented in the first part on the EU legislation and regulation on hard renovation solutions, such as thermal insulation of heating systems. Are there any other drivers that could help to decrease the energy consumption of existing buildings? And what are their potentials? Yes, uh, as usual, uh, people tend to focus to technical solution, but in building behavior is very important. And you can lose a lot through behaviors in the sense that you can implement, uh, you can have very uh, well insulating building, you can implement uh, interesting package to refurbish the dwellings, but if you don't address behavior, you may lose part of the savings uh, through the so-called uh, rebound effect, the fact that they also will uh, increase their comfort and at the end you lose part of the expected savings. So what is important is to address behavior, and behavior can be now addressed through a lot of uh, ICT device uh, uh, 
which can uh, uh, with quite advanced system to control heating to uh, plan the heating shut off when you know that in three days the uh, weather will uh, warm up and so on with lighting with air conditioning in, in all area so about the legislation what has been done uh, actually I did not mention it so it's thank you for the question is that uh, in the energy efficiency directive it is uh, made mandatory to address this issue uh, through um, the installation of a smart meter for uh, electricity and gas that uh, will become somehow mandatory in all EU countries and we can expect that by 2020 most households will have uh, so-called smart meters. Uh, the fact that um, the, the country should promote uh, smart billing. It means billing that is informative for the consumer. There are a lot of uh, aspects that uh, look at this aspect of, uh, of behaviors. So I would say that uh, soft solution uh, for energy efficiency are complementary and as important as the technical solution. I don't know if you want to add something. So that was my answer to this first question. Great, thank you, Bruno. <clears throat> and um, I'll move on now to our next question from the audience. And this question comes from one of our attendees who actually works for a housing agency in Albania and is working on um, introducing new building standards for houses, uh, specifically low-cost, low-income, uh, low-income houses. And they say that these families um, usually try to save money. Uh, just by not using it, not through energy efficiency measures necessarily, but by simply not using the energy. Uh, therefore, calculating the cost of efficiency of standards is very difficult. Are there any recommendations on how to address cases like this? Well, the issue you raise is a very burning issue in uh, all European countries. Uh, it's called so-called fuel poverty. And there are a lot of studies about uh, how many households are in so-called fuel poverty. It means that they cannot have the comfort they should have and because they have to save on, on their bills, so they have to not to eat or to lower the heating temperature. And, and the number of households in fuel poverty have increased a lot with the economic crisis. So a lot of countries have designed specific programs for low-income uh, households. Um, which uh, include mainly uh, a financial package where organizations take in charge the investment and where most of, of the cost is subsidized actually through a public funding because you cannot expect this household to, uh, to invest themselves in uh, saving energy and in addition to that these uh, low-income households are the ones that usually live in the less insulated dwelling with the poorest quality. So the, the potential in these households is very high, the potential of energy savings, but the capability of these households to make the necessary investment is, a, is limited. So you need to go to third party to invest and without expecting to earn money from that. So one program is public funding and there are a lot of programs in, uh, in EU country and especially in the new member country where the quality of our cinema is, is less good than in the old member countries and part is financed through special funds from the European Commission that are called structural funds that are then given to the country that can set up a fund, to, a national fund to, to subsidize uh, to, to quite high level of percentage of the total cost. In addition, there are interesting approach, and the UK was the first one to, uh, to do it, with uh, one measure that uh, Karin mentioned, and maybe we should insist on that, uh, that is the energy uh, saving obligation that has been introduced uh, maybe 20 years ago, has changed several times name, and now it's called ECHO, that makes mandatory to uh, electric and gas utility to get saving from their customers. And in the UK, uh, they have, uh, now I don't remember exactly if it is still the, the same percentage, but until recently 50% of the, 
of their total savings they had to make because they have quota of savings that they have to prove should be made with low income households. So it's to force the utility to pay for these investment. In France, uh, we have also some kind of uh, policy, but it is less uh, quantified, like uh, saying that it should be 50%. Uh, yeah, your question was also addressed to, to the, the regulation and how to calculate uh, this cost optimal regulation. Actually, you don't make regulation just for low income households. The regulation are for all households, and they are calculated for a normal uh, standard of living. So in short, uh, I would say that this uh, issue of uh, fuel property is not only an energy efficiency issue, it's a social issue. It's to improve the living standard, the quality of life of low income household. Uh, I would like to come back to, <laughs> to what was said about the, the Green Deal and the, this golden road. The, the idea was very great to uh, arrange a package where at the end the household would have a better insulated dwelling without paying more for his energy bill than before. Did not work well, and it was this idea of the golden rule. I don't think we should cancel the golden rule. So there is an interesting example that was very successful, which was dealing with less important investment, uh, which has been done in, in Tunisia. It's called the ProSol program for the uh, diffusion of solar water heaters, and it was really a success. And it was exactly the same setting as what expla was explained by uh, Karin for uh, UK for the Green Deal. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bruno, very much. Um, and we had another question come in. It asks, on the KFW, do we know um, how the federal public support breaks down between the straight cash grant and the repayment bonus and interest rate subsidy? Um, well, you're asking um, if what's the what are the difference between the repayment bonus and the and the and the grant? Yeah, I believe they're they're asking um, how the the public uh, support was spent, break brought uh, broken down between the straight cash grants and repayment bonus, and then the interest rate subsidy. We can yeah, come back to this. I can try to answer. Yeah, we sure, we, we don't have the number right now, but uh, I'm sure we can easily find it. What she has shown is the distribution of the uh, the measure or the number of households that get a subsidy and the others that get a loan. But in terms of what it costs for the public budget, uh, of course, we, we have to find the allocation which would be different uh, from what was given. But what we have to to conclude about KFW is that the cost for the public budget is very low compared to the benefit in terms of investment and impact on the economy because as was said it, it's a factor 20. So for one euro of public money given through grants or through a subsidized loan, you get 20 euro of investment which means more jobs and more material to be sold and so on. So it, it has a positive, very positive impact on the economy. And probably, uh, and I think I've seen a study on that, the federal state government get more money through taxes it gets on the labor and on the sale of the materials. So it's a 100% benefit, it's a win-win strategy for the federal government. For one euro he spent, he gets more money back through taxes. Great. Thank you, Bruno. Um, and so this next question also is in regards to the KFW program. It asks, does it provide some kind of technical assistance to owners on how to select the energy efficiency measures? Yes, of course, it's at the, the, the Green Deal uh, before uh, benefiting from uh, the KFW grant alone. Uh, KFW uh, assessment has to be uh, done. It's the, the precondition as well. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kareem. Um, and another question that came in, um, it states that public support is justified if social returns exceed financial returns. What is the best scheme in this regard? You're asking the best scheme in terms of public support and social uh, aspects, both? Yes, so they're stating that public support is justified when social returns exceed financial returns. And they're wondering what the best way to, um, the best scheme in this regard. I, I, I'm guessing that they're, they are asking um, how you get those social returns to exceed financial returns. Uh, well, I would like to say that uh, the, the, the Green Deal, uh, the Green Deal uh, scheme, the, the loan uh, in terms of uh, social uh, aspects is not working because they, uh, a lot of households cannot reach the, the, the golden rule. So finally, uh, the, for this um, uh, household, they uh, they can benefit from uh, the ECO uh, program, as uh, Bruno uh, said. And we think that uh, in terms of uh, public support, um, it uh, asks for grants, so for subsidy uh, schemes. And the KFW um, is uh, asking as well for public budget, but just as a uh, Bruno said the, the leverage effect is very good, that, that is to say for one uh, dollar invested or given by uh, the government, uh, it's like a $20 uh, dollars, uh, investment in the insulation, uh, uh, insulation activity uh, in the country. So uh, the best uh, scheme for me is the KFW uh, in terms of uh, uh, social because it gives access to everybody with a very very good uh, interest loan at one uh, one percent plus this repayment bonus or this grant that is uh, depending on the energy efficiency uh, standards. Thank you, Karine. Uh, moving on now to another question. They ask, how do you deal with the case of insulation applied deteriorating faster than the loan recovery. And this could probably be spread out to other technologies, something that uh, deteriorates quicker than the, um, the loan recovery. Yeah, this is a good question and uh, does not only apply to insulation but also to other materials. First of all, one way is to put quality standards on the uh, and quality certification on the materials, uh, which is what is uh, being done in a lot, lot of countries. Especially, the, it is a condition to get access to public funding, public subsidies, and all the program uh, Karin mentioned. You to do to have it, you have to go to certify installers and to certify materials to avoid low quality uh, material. The, uh, and equipment. And in addition, in the cost uh, calculation, uh, cost optimal calculation, uh, this is taken into account. I, even if the calculation is done over 30 years, if it is uh, for certain type of insulation material, if we know we have to replace them after 15 years, this can be taken into account. We said it takes into account all costs that occur over the 30 years, including the, the, so some kind of maintenance. Maybe I did not insist enough, but uh, if people go to the publication on the entrance website, there is a lot of detail of what is taken into account in this cost optimal calculation. Thank you. Thanks again, Bruno. Um, and another attendee asked, uh, this, the, this question has a couple parts in it, so let me read the whole thing and I'll repeat it if needed. What are the actors which participated in the different schemes? Were they institutional investor, investors or households? And is there anything in the schemes to tackle the issue of the landowner tenants incentives mismatch? 
So the first part of that question is who are the actors that participated in the differences, different schemes, institutional investors or households or other? Well, in the case of the, the Green Deal, uh, as I explained to you on the slide, there is uh, several actors. Uh, for the Green Deal finance, there is the household, of course, that asks for an assessment. And then you have uh, the audit that is made by an assessor that are certified by the, the UK government. And then you have the provider that is as well um, certified by the government as is making the contract with the household. And then there is a Green Deal installer that is certified by the household and is um, implementing the, the measures. Besides um, the Green Deal installers um, with the, within the contract, they, they, they propose loans with banks and so on. Um, and everything uh, is certified by the UK government thanks to um, the, the, the golden rule. However, I would like to mention that this, not, this golden rule is not a guarantee and that's why the Green Deal has been highly uh, criticized because um, uh, the assessment, uh, the assessor uh, recommends the, the measures that could uh, uh, that meets the, the golden rule, but in reality it's not uh, guaranteed that the savings will be higher than the, the loan repayment. Anyway, that was just a, a, a comment. Uh, and then concerning still the, the UK uh, Green Deal that is highly uh, dependent and linked to the energy company obligation, here you have, as Bruno uh, repeated, the energy uh, suppliers that are involved uh, in that scheme. Uh, and Bruno wants to add something? The question was more on the who is investing in the uh, in, in situation, for instance. And I think most of these schemes they, they address also not uh, normal investors. Um, the only way where investors may, may come in, but uh, it is not the case in these countries, but something that uh, was considered in France, when you have uh, an energy saving obligation scheme with energy utilities, it means they have to they have to make savings and they get a certificate to show that they have obtained this saving and they can trade the certificate on the market, especially for companies that did not manage to reach their target. And one way to put the investor in this uh, trading is to allow them to invest in energy saving and then sell certificate to the utilities that have the obligation. And this is a, uh, an interesting uh, move for energy saving obligations. This energy saving obligation that uh, like ECO in, in UK exists in about eight countries, so more countries uh, should uh, be included because there is some uh, uh, some indication in one article called Article 7 of the Energy Efficiency Directive that give incentive to country to implement uh, an energy saving obligation. An energy saving obligation is related to a, a trading of a certificate of saving like uh, for the carbon certificate and so on. Okay, Thank you. Sorry, just, uh, and then there was the second part of the question. Shana, sorry. Um, can I add something? Yes, go. Okay. Um, sorry uh, so if I misunderstood the question. And I just wanted to say that, that for the KFW program, I presented mainly uh, the program that targets household, but of course you have the same type of uh, pro, um, incentive tar targeting the, the service sector. And then the second part of the question was uh, to know the, the signals to owners uh, why they would choose uh, this scheme uh, to lend owner incentives, no? <laughs> uh, so in the, in the green... The second deal, part was... Go ahead, Sean. Yep. Karine, I was just going to repeat, the second part of the question was asking if there's anything in the schemes to tackle the issue of mismatch between landowner and tenant in incentives. Uh, no, these two schemes uh, focus on, uh, on landowner, however, 
the Green Deal say that if you uh, sell or the, 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 if the property change uh, <coughs> tenants, uh, then the, the energy bill, the, the loan that is repaired by the energy bill, we pass through the new uh, tenant owner or uh, rental. Great, thank you, Karine. Um, and I'll move on now then to the next question. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Bruno. Uh, yeah, probably these schemes that do not address they are really targeted the owner of, uh, of dwellings, but uh, in some countries they have introduced in the, their legislation the possibility for um, renter to implement uh, energy saving solution and to, or, or owners to implement saving and to increase the, the rent in both ways. So there are some legal texts uh, addressing this issue where either the renter can implement saving and lower his rent or the other way around, increase the rent in case it is the owner that is implementing solutions. Because you are right, this is a, a key issue, this uh, land owner incentive mismatch. Great, thank you. Um, and how is the uh, public made aware of all these uh, of these schemes? Yeah, I, I, I can answer in the case of uh, of UK. Uh, because of this energy saving obligation, the uh, energy utilities they have any way to, to do some savings. So for them, it's kind of like marketing. They are, they are doing marketing to sell electricity and gas to get new customers, but they have also to market energy saving solutions. Uh, in the same way, the installers, they know there is this program. That you, you get probably a lot of uh, advertisement by the different companies that uh, Karine mentioned that are part of the, because for them, it is new business. So they go to the customer and they offer the service. In France, we see that we, because we have also an energy saving obligation like ECO in UK, and the companies they manage to to propose use of loan uh, subsidies if you change your boiler, if you if you buy very uh, efficient refrigerator. And it's like marketing of uh, of product. And. Uh, to address this issue of information, which is key, and maybe uh, it was not stressed enough in the one of the last slides that compares uh, the policy scenarios that were tested in entrance, uh, the information of the public is uh, very important. And all countries recognize that. You can have scheme, but people don't know it exists, they don't know it works, they find it too complicated. Uh, just when you see the different step of uh, the uh, the Green Deal scheme it may, may look very complicated for uneducated uh, households. So what is the approach is to, to disseminate uh, information uh, uh, office uh, everywhere in the cities where people can go or in the office of uh, companies to inform the consumers about what are the solutions. Now France has taken a very uh, strong uh, decision in that area and they created what is called a one-stop shop where you, I don't know how many we have in France, but uh, in all, all cities, maybe several hundred, there may be more than thousand uh, shops where people can also can come in but also uh, small companies or anybody can receive information on technical solution on the fact that they can get a list of uh, companies that can come to their home to do audits and uh, tell you how much it will cost the audits. And also about all the, the complex uh, package that they get to get funding. Because uh, as in many countries there exists a lot of programs where what we quoted for UK and it's probably not exhaustive because you have local program, regional program and so on. The consumers they are lost. Uh, with all these uh, possibilities. So they, if they go to this shop, the advisor will tell them what they can do and how they can finance it. Before we used to have information center, but this link with the financial possibility uh, was a bit missing. So this is this idea of what we call the one-stop shop. 
Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, yep, and we, we have a, a few more questions to get to, but we are starting to run a little low on time. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll just keep the rest of these remaining questions um, brief if we can. Uh, someone, one of the attendees was wondering if you could discuss some of the scopes and barriers to public and private partnerships in implementing other energy efficiency schemes in learning lessons for developing countries. So what are the, um, the, what are the barriers to public and private partnerships in implementing energy efficiency schemes? And what are some lessons for developing countries? This is a whole conference. <laughs> it's difficult to answer in a few words. Uh, just public-private pa partnership works mainly for the, uh, the public sector. It's more dealing with service sector, which which is building still, uh, but less in uh, the household sector. And there are a lot of experience. And Germany is again one country that has a lot of uh, experience in that area. You may ask why Germany. Germany because they were confronted to the rebuilding of all the eastern part of the country when there was a reunification, where the quality of building was not as good as on the western part. So they, it's like this that KFW started to develop its program. And in addition to that, they developed a lot of public partnership to uh, renovate uh, public buildings. Um, I did not mention it, but it is on one of the first slides. We are involved in a project with the World Energy Council for, for some time, reviewing uh, the interesting uh, policy experience in the world. Uh, I think the address of the website is uh, given at the end. And I suggest that people can go there and they will find information about different policy case studies we have done. And one of them was addressing uh, this uh, issue of uh, ESCOs and public-private uh, partnership. Yeah, uh, it's true also these energy saving obligations are a kind of public-private partnership where the private partner is a utility and the public is a consumer. Uh, but we don't have much experience. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there are two countries in the world, uh, to my knowledge, which are not uh, OECD countries where they have developed energy uh, obligation for uh, companies. It's Uruguay and Brazil where electric utility has to spend money on, uh, on energy efficiency uh, for, for the consumer, but usually it's mainly targeted to household sector. But it could be, this approach is interesting. I would recommend to, to look at the experience of Uruguay and, uh, uh, and Brazil, and especially Uruguay. They have a very comprehensive approach to energy saving. Thank you. Thank you again, Bruno. Uh, and we, I received two questions from attendees that are somewhat related. They're um, asking your opinion of, of other um, mechanisms used for energy efficiency. So I'll loop these, I'll group these two together. Uh, the first one asked uh, what your opinions of white certificate schemes for the energy efficiency retrofit of residential buildings. The second one asked what your opinion was regarding housing in building sector under um, the carbon market credit schemes to benefit customers. So again, that first one asked what your uh, what your opinion or outlook or experience was with white certificate schemes for the energy efficiency retrofit of residential dwellings. And the second one asked regarding um, your opinion um, on the housing and building sector mm -hmm. under carbon market credit schemes. Okay, concerning the, the first part, uh, at least, and I'm sure that Bruno will complete. Um, concerning the white certificate, so uh, we have seen uh, in the case of the Green Deal uh, finance that is uh, linked to the energy, uh, uh, the eco, uh, the energy company obligation, which is a white certificate. Uh, the, the figures on the on the slide I showed you are uh, 
showed that um, there is a, a high number of applications and um, it, it works well. Uh, however, um, as I told you, since the implementation of the ECO, um, the, the, the white schemes in the UK did not uh, target the deep retrofit and the cavity and the loft insulation decreased compared to the previous uh, mechanism, uh, the carbon energy um, reduction target. And uh, in France, uh, the white uh, certificate schemes uh, targets mainly uh, residential uh, and um, concern mainly the replacement of uh, boilers. Um, so that's true again that uh, in terms of deep retrofit uh, is not really efficient, but uh, in a sense it's a good way to, uh, to at least implement uh, one measure, a single measure. The reason for that is that the companies that have the obligation, they start with easy solutions. Sorry? No, go ahead, Bruno. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The companies start with easy solutions. So deep retrofitting or addressing the building shell is more expensive. But as you increase the uh, obligation, and in France, we start, we have, a, we are the third, third program. The first one was easy to read. The second one, a bit, uh, the target was a bit more ambitious. The third program is very ambitious. So it means the companies will have to go through uh, uh, taking into account part of the, uh, the refurbishment of, on insulation, on windows and so on. As to the question of the, the, the link with the also housing carbon, uh, or the idea of housing carbon market, the problem we, we have to address here is to avoid that uh, instrument uh, conflict uh, between them. So for instance, industry is a sector where white certificate is not eligible because in Europe, because in, in big industries they are in the uh, energy, uh, the carbon uh, trading scheme. Buildings they are more with white certificates. So I don't think you can have both because it would be a bit confusing, there can be double counting. So most of the measures uh, in Europe now, they really differentiate the sector where it will be mainly carbon uh, market mechanism and the sectors where it will be other mechanism including this white certificate. And clearly building has been put with the white certificate. Thank you. Thank you again uh, to both uh, Karine and Bruno for that. We are running out of time, so we'll have to move along now to, uh, to wrap up the webinar. And before we do, I do just ask the attendees to take a brief moment to answer a survey that we have. It's just three very short questions that help us evaluate how we do. So the first question, uh, which can be answered right in the GoToWebinar window, is the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. And the next question is the webinars presented. And then the final question, overall the webinar met my expectations. Great. Thank you for answering our survey and on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I would just like to extend a thank you to all of our expert panelists and our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate everyone's time and I do invite the attendees to check the Solutions Center website if you would like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations as well as previously held webinars. Additionally, you'll find information on upcoming webinars and other training events, and we are now also posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Please do allow for about one week for the recordings to be posted, and we invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solutions Center resources and services, including the no-cost Ask an Expert policy uh, support. 
And with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. And this concludes our webinar.